it. Yeah. And uh, I have to apologize and remove the badge and put up GE Free New Zealand. I hope I don't get any of those lovely tomatoes thrown at me for that. I hear there's a bit of rivalry, but that's that's rumor. <laughs> so I just want to get started. So I'd like to first by saying that I wasn't always an activist, I was a pediatrician. And I started in this business approximately 10 years ago through my mom's group. And what happened was I was doing my business, raising my children, carting my kids to soccer games, running the school PTA, and my, one of my patients said, Michelle, we need a pe pediatrician, and you'll do. And I said, oh, no, no, no. I'm too busy, I'm a busy mom, I, I just got too much on my plate. And I said, okay, fine, I'll do it. And what we did was we stopped the spray against this light brown apple moth in Northern California. They wanted to spray the entire coast so that the apples wouldn't brown, and we stopped it. And then one of the moms said to me, hey, Michelle, what do you think about GMOs and Jeffrey Smith? And I said, uh, I don't know. And I started reading a book called Seeds of Deception. It was particularly horrified, and the rest is history, and here I am. <laughs> so I want to talk to you about food. Children are my favorite topic. Food is my second. So just by a show of hands, how many people here have a problem with food? I'm just curious. OK, my people. All right. So what, what we're going to talk about this evening, and I'm going to base this entire talk about this problem, gluten, fad or reality. So what are we reading back home? Uh, we're reading several incredible books. Look at this. Brain Brain, Wheat Belly. These are written by two physicians about the problem with gluten. Dr. Davis and Dr. Uh, Perlmutter both have new books coming out, which I've learned through one of the grandpas at our meeting last night. So I came all the way down here to learn about what's happening in some authors back home, and you guys are on top of things. I was impressed. But what I'd like to say that these guys didn't get the whole picture. And I'm hoping by the end of our conversation with me this evening, you're going to have a bit better understanding of what's going on with the gluten issue than these physicians. Now I'm trying to be too arrogant. Just a little. So let's get started. Let me tell you about what's happening back in California. We're having such a problem with food allergies in California that right now it's a state law in California that schools have to stop something called EpiPen. Those are pens stop epinephrine or life threatening food allergies called anaphylaxis. So I thought this was an American problem that you guys down here were, weren't having this issue. But as we've been giving our talks when I was in Melbourne, we happened to be in a primary school. I look over at the board, and they had a list of children with anaphylactic reactions, their names, and who needed EpiPens. It was 14% of that particular primary school. So I thought, hmm, maybe it's just not an American problem. Maybe it's an Australian problem. And it appears that it may be a New Zealand problem as well. So food allergy, it's a growing problem. It's nearly affecting, oh, it says six million here, it's more than that. The problem is huge, and eight percent of all children have this issue. Young children are affected, boys more than girls, and food allergies are associated with other conditions as well. Not to mention the huge economic cost of this particular problem. So let me take you for a second to Marin County, where I live. Beautiful, I live on the other side of the Golden Gate Bridge. It's the eighth wealthiest county in the United States. So these are kids of means where I live. Look at my hometown of Fairfax, California, where we have water. That's where that's what it looks like. And I have a, my blue healer mutt, and that's where I walk her. Look at my beautiful institution for health and healing with Mount Town of Pius in the background. Uh, so in this serene setting, with a, a fair amount of people with access, financial access, you would think that our children would be incredibly healthy, right? Right? When that, some people say, yeah, you would think so. But no. We're having a children's health crisis. It's not just my little clinic in Marin County, California, that's having a health crisis. It's a U.S. crisis. Particularly, one out of two children now in the U.S. has a chronic disease. So that is profound. So, come share with me a day in my office. This is what I see all day long as an integrated pediatrician. That's what I do. So I see increases in digestive disorders. And in this talk, we're going to focus on gut problems. 
because I'm seeing gut problems literally all day long. And most of integrative health is based on gut healing. Kids who cannot fight infection, they have problems with their immune systems. Their immune systems are sluggish. I actually check a lot of these values on lab testing and I find a lot of abnormalities. Kids with a lot of asthma, allergies, environmental allergies, chronic ear infections, and sinus infections. And last night's talk in Hamilton, people are also saying that here in New Zealand you have a significant problem of asthma and allergies as well. So this is a big problem for you guys too. What's really concerning is if this isn't all bad enough, our neurologic problems I'm seeing a huge rise of kids with attention deficit disorder, autistic, autistic spectrum disorder, one in 50 kids right now. Back when I was a resident, it was one in 10,000. So you see how it's escalating and it's predicted to go even higher. Kids with various processing disorders, etc. Uh, fertility issues are a massive problem in the U.S. If you take a picture of a street corner in Iowa, you might see four infertility clinics. Problems with endocrine disorders, and one of my colleagues, Dr. Antonio, is going to talk further about that this evening, and stressed out parents. And those stressed out parents totally stress me out. So, <laughs> let's see, we average a box of tissues per week in my little office, two teary phone calls per day, 37 frantic emails, you get the picture. One of my happy clients is very satisfied with my work. <laughs> so this is the first time in modern history where parents are healthier than their children. And I think this will kind of ring a bell on why we're here this evening. So I mentioned before, we're going to start looking at the gut. So what kind of digestive issues am I seeing? Well, I'm running the gamut. We're seeing Abdominal pain, the most common complaint of pain in children is abdominal pain. Uh, food allergies, we mentioned. Reflux, where the food comes back up in the back of the throat and then kids fall it down. Parents don't even know their kids have reflux because the kids don't know that it's abnormal. Loading, kids with big tummies and a lot of uh, gassy tummies. Constipation, diarrhea. Obesity, particularly with trunkal obesity where the tummies are fat across the middle. That's immunologically active fat. Immune dysfunction, as we mentioned, kids who are not growing, that's called failure to thrive. Inflammatory bowel disease, which is an autoimmune disease, such as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, where the body attacks itself. I have just diagnosed an 18 month old with ulcerative colitis in my office, and previously, 18 month olds with ulcerative colitis was unheard of, as well as poor absorption of nutrients. So, what's causing the baby to cry? I'm sure you have your own images of which politician you like to put in that picture. <laughs> Let me just show you the, the first two ingredients in American infant formula. It was different in Australia. It might be different here in New Zealand. But as you can see, and I apologize for the quality of this slide, the first two ingredients are corn syrup and sugar. And the corn syrup is genetically modified, and sugar is high fructose corn syrup. Yum, yum. So, that first slide I talked to you about gluten, fat or reality, and now we're going to get into it a, bit, a little bit further. So now I'm going to bounce around a little bit. I hope I see a lot of women in the audience, so you gals will be able to follow me because I'm going to be all over the place, and then I'll come home for the big musical number in the end. Guys, you guys are linear thinkers, just hang with me, and I'll try to bring it all together. <laughs> so, what is gluten sensitivity? Well, let's define what gluten is. It, it's a, a substance that has two proteins in it, gluten and glutenin. And when the flour is mixed with water, it gluten forms a sticky kind of doughy substance and allows, allows the bread to rise. So that's basically what gluten is. It's found in wheat, barley, rye, spelt, oats, <laughs> triticale, and a few other grains. So what's celiac disease? This is right off the celiac disease website. I didn't invent this. It's an autoimmune disorder that occurs in a certain genetic population. And the ingestion of fluid, uh, gluten, particularly the gluten part of protein, promotes the immune system to attack the small intestine. And it damages the villi. The villi are the little finger-like projections that line the intestinal lining, and it blunts them. When it blunts them, you get inappropriate absorption of nutrients. It's one of the problems with celiac disease. It affects one in 100 people worldwide. And, it, and when you have celiac disease, 
you can develop other autoimmune disorders and a high rate of cancer. I'm going to bring in another concept, leaky gut. Is there a link between gluten and leaky gut? So first I need to define for you what is leaky gut? What am I talking leaky gut? Well, it's a condition that is defined by intestinal permeability. Normally, the cells that line your intestinal lining should be really tight, nice tight junctions that only allow things to go through when your body says so by these little sentinel uh, cells called zonules that line it. However, gluten can cause inappropriate opening of these zonules and the gluten gets broken, is released before it's officially broken down completely into a large uh, molecule called gluteomorphin. So if you think about that name gluteomorphin, it sounds a lot like morphine and opiate. And when that stuff goes up into your brain, it can bind certain receptors in your brain that make you feel very happy. You've heard people say, I love bread. Love, it's a chemical reaction. They're actually getting a little addiction high from it. Uh, milk does the same, for example, casein that also can activate certain uh, receptors in your brain, endorphin receptors. So, when this stuff becomes leaky and the gluten molecule passes through, it's not being completely broken down. Your immune system on the other side sees this food as a foreign invader and mounts an immune response. So literally, you're having an immune reaction to food and that should not be happening. But other things can get through as well, such as toxins, microbes, etc. So let me talk to you a little bit about this scientist. His name is Dr. Arpad Pusti. And Pusti uh, is a Hungarian scientist, was in the UK back in the 90s. He was approached to look at GMOs. So now I'm going to bring in yet one more concept, genetically modified food. And Dr. Arpad Pusti, and I'll say, hopefully I'm saying his name right because I'm married to a Hungarian, and I know he's not here tonight, he's up north, that's good. And so Dr. Pusti did a very beautiful study. He looked at rats and fed them potatoes. One group he fed GM potatoes and one non-GM potatoes. And then he compared the intestinal wall of these two groups of rats using histopathological slides. And what he found was very interesting. Now remember, this was 19 years ago. So we've known this for a long time. If you look at the intestinal wall on the first set of slides to your right, right uh, the non-GMO, those are villi, they look perfect. But the GMO-fed scratch had a disruption of the architecture of the villi. Oh. <laughs> no wonder you were all looking confused. <laughs> and I thought it was just like, gee, I'm not explaining this right. Okay, let me take it again. Apologies. So, intestinal wall, stomach lining. Non-GMO villi, GMO-fed villi. Can you all see the difference, even though I know you're not histopathologist? between those two groups of villi, they don't look the same, do I? Do they? You see how one looks disrupted. And so when I first saw these slides, you know, 10 years ago from my mom's group, I had a light bulb go off and I had an aha uh -huh moment. I thought, oh no, really? Is this why I'm seeing all these kids with leaky guts? That GMOs are causing this breakdown of the architecture. That was the first time I had a really bright moment about what was going on with children's health. The stomach lining, if you see the GMO lining there, you see how it looks much taller, that forest right there compared to the non-GMO. That's called hyperplastic cell growth in the stomach lining. It's abnormal and a precursor to cancer. So what Dr. Pusti found out, nutritional content was different. These two groups of GM potatoes was less than conventionally grown potatoes. The nutritional content was not equivalent. Rats that ate the GMO potatoes had damaged immune systems and organ damage as well. So that's what he discovered. He made his announcement, he went on the BBC, he was a hero for two days, and then he was fired. So I'm not doing a political talk tonight, I want to have a nice medical talk, but you guys can chew on that on your way home tonight. Think about that. So now I'm going to bring in another concept, gluten and your biome. So what on earth is your biome? It's a hot topic. We're all talking biome back now at home. And your biome is your microbiology, the germs in your gut. And remember, your gut is everything from your mouth to the tush. 
That's, that's your gut. The whole thing is your gut. And there is a whole group of organisms that converse together through a very sophisticated system called quorum sensing. They're not just hanging out. There are a lot of them, more than human cells, actually 10 to 1. So we are mostly bacteria. So I would have to suggest you love your bacteria. These guys are in a balance. It's a microbial balance. And what I see in children now is this balance is abnormal. We have a low microbial diversity in our children in the States. And I suspect you have it here in New Zealand as well. So we need to talk a little bit about what these bacteria do. They supply us with amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. They convert tryptophan to serotonin to melatonin. Now what the heck is that? Have you all heard of melatonin? It's the stuff you can take that may help you sleep as a sleeping aid. Well, if you can't make this conversion in your gut, you might not be able to sleep. I didn't tell you on that list of slides that my sick kids, a lot of them can't sleep particularly the ones with ADHD and autistic spectrum. And this is profound. If the kid is not sleeping, the whole family's awake, stressed out parents. They maintain the epithelial barrier of the gastrointestinal tract. They guide your immune system from birth. So when you have a vaginal birth, the baby acquires mom's biome, and that begins their own immune uh, system develops from that. It's called innate immune immunity. And so, if you have a cesarean section, you're already at an immuno immunological disadvantage. Approximately one third, a little bit less, of deliveries now are cesarean in the US. I had one myself. If you don't have a baby, by the time you can do a drive through in the US, you get a cesarean. They detoxify your toxins before reaching the liver, and they produce vitamins such as vitamin K. Another topic glyphosate. Glyphosate's a pesticide. It kills insects and herbs. So you're thinking to yourself, oh, wait a minute. This doc, she started talking about gluten, then she talked about uh, leaky gut, then she started talking about dysbiosis, and now she's bringing glyphosate. I will I'll explain it all in the end. I have to keep introducing all, of, all these terms to you, and you look like a pretty clever audience. <coughs> you know, I think you can hang with me, everyone still hang with me? Yeah, okay, good. So. Glyphosate's pesticide, it's a pesticide in Roundup. Remember, genetically engineered crops were designed so that you could spray Roundup on them. That's it, simple. I'm a simple pediatrician, that's all there is to it. That's why we have genetically engineered crops, to withstand the spray of pesticides. So, when they first brought this glyphosate out, they said, and we were told it was harmless to humans because we didn't have a certain pathway that plants have called the Shikamaki pathway. So we don't have this pathway, however, our bacteria do. This is the second light bulb that went off for me. I went, oh no, got it right away. You all get it? Are you having light bulbs flash? That's what I said. So what is the effect of glyphosate on your gut? So normally when I don't understand something in medicine, I go to the literature, I read. But there's no human literature on this subject. So I had to go to the poultry literature. I'm a pediatrician, it's pretty close. So what I found from this study from Germany, that highly pathogenic bacteria like Salmonella and Clostridia were resistant to glyphosate. They didn't die off. However, beneficial bacteria like Lactobacillus, it's in yogurt, Bifidus, very common in baby's guts, died off. That's what we learned. I wanted to show you this study as well because Dr. Heinemann is from uh, in New Zealand. He just published it this week and he found out more about uh, commercial formula, uh, formulations of herbicides and can cause antibiotic resistance. Another huge problem. This is my favorite genetically modified movie. I thought I could share my movie taste with you while we're here talking together. Let's talk about a few more studies. I'm not going to be doing an appropriate medical talk here without some studies to back up what I'm saying. So let's look at this study that came out of Melbourne a couple of months ago. And if you look at the title, Non-Celiac Insensitivity Triggers Gut Dysbiosis, that imbalance in the gut that we're talking about, inflamed brain, I want to talk to you about that is, and a disruption in the gut-brain uh, axis. 
This is your gut and your brain are linked. The gut's unhealthy, the brain's going to be unhealthy, and vice versa. So it's a lot of information. My 17-year-old vetoed this slide. She said, too much information, Mom, you should just know it. Okay, so I get old, I need a little bit of prompting here, but I do know what this slide says. It's an important stuff in here. And basically what that study said, that dysbiosis, the microbial imbalance, in non-celiac sensitivity, causes gut inflammation, diarrhea, constipation, etc. You have abnormal microbes that are developing and that are propagating, and they can do something called lipopolysaccharides. Those are the lipopolysaccharides get up out of your bloodstream, go up a major nerve to your brain called the vagus nerve, and activate immune cells in your brain called microglial cells. They can also do other things as well as like activate neuro um, excited, excited toxins and other things. And so now we know that if the gut is inflamed, it can cause secondary brain inflammation. Brain inflammation, well, what does that look like in children? How do you know your kid has brain inflammation? Well, I'll tell you. They can't focus in school. Their moods are labile. They're super cranky. I think my husband has brain inflammation. <laughs> They have mood disturbances. You can see that they're just labile, and that's some of the kids I'm seeing. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what glyphosate does. So what is that pesticide, the main ingredient Roundup? What does it do? One of the most important things it does, it's a chelator. What does chelation mean? It binds minerals. Which ones? Just about all of them. Those metalloproteins, those minerals, are required for almost all your body functions. For example, zinc is needed in about 250 reactions in your brain, magnesium about 200. What am I seeing? Kids with low zinc levels and low magnesium levels. How do I know? I check them. It's a blood test. I measure it in their red blood cells. It inhibits cytochrome P450. That is a major detoxification system in your liver. And it also inhibits the conversion of vitamin D2 to the active form, which is D3. What am I seeing in the US? Kids with low vitamin D levels, vitamin D3. In a sunshiny state like California, they have low vitamin D levels. Low vitamin D levels, it's actually a hormone, immune dysfunction. Kills beneficial bacteria, you heard that. Impairs sulfate synthesis. That's involved with kids <coughs> on the spectrum, a whole, a whole other big topic. Livestock illness, I'm gonna talk about this in a second. You get increased brain due to resistance and you can increase growth of plant pathogens such as fungi and uh, production of mycotoxins. Those are uh, toxins from uh, fungi. So, this paper came out very recently by Dr. Sansel and Dr. Senna, and they, they basically said glyphosate disruption of the sugarmonic pathway is due in part to its chelation of manganese. So now we know exactly that glyphosate seems to really like manganese, and you need manganese for multiple neurologic processes in your body. So I mentioned to you, when I don't understand something, I go to the literature, or I look to see what smart people are saying, I look to see what Dr. Nancy Swanson is saying, and she is a physicist who worked in the Army, she was in Washington State in the US, and she just talks about this glyphosate, it's toxic stuff. Chelator, we've known that for 40 years. Herbicide, Monsanto filed a patent for uh, glyphosate as an antibiotic, antibiotic in 2002. And we also for a protozoal, anti-protozoal agent. But what Nancy also talks about is celiac disease and glyphosate applied on wheat as a desiccant. So we're putting glyphosate on a non-tolerant crop to dry it out. And we're applying a lot of it. And you're gonna hear more of this tonight from my colleagues. So if you look on the vertical axis, is glyphosate applied on wheat? Horizontal axis is the rate of celiac disease. This is not cause and effect, but you see a relationship. So I'm beginning for you to ask the same questions that I ask, because I think I have most of my days, I have more questions than answers. What's the relationship? Some of you may know about Dr. Judy Carmen. She's an Australian in Adelaide at Flinders University. She did a great pig study and I'm not trying to gross you guys out with pig studies, but this is important because one of my patients told me when he heard me talk about this in the US, he saw the pig slide and he changed his diet. 
So I thought, I'll throw it back in there. Sure. So on the right, you see the redness of that stomach and the GM-fed pigs. And then you see that nice pale gray, normal tummies, non-GM-fed pigs. So the pigs who are given the GM feed have significant, significant amounts of intestinal inflammation, stomach inflammation. And pigs' intestines are very close to humans. Maybe other things about pigs are close to humans too. <laughs> Alex Vasquez, another great doc, he made glyphosate the most toxic chemical of the year at an Institute for Functional Medicine conference. That's where a lot of uh, we integrative docs work, or a lot of us are functional medicine docs. And so his Vimeo is awesome. Another gentleman I'll introduce you to, Dr. Robert Kremer. He's a retired research microbiologist from the United States Department of Agriculture. And he just retired after 33 years. So he does a stint with our USDA. He retires and then comes out and tells us, well, gee, those GMO seeds, they're not saving farmers money. The seed quality is not so good. They're slow to emerge. They lose viability. You need to coat them with fungicides, insecticides, and nutrients. Now, I'm like, this is not making good common sense. Something is not great about these seeds. <coughs> one, more, uh, one more role model for me, I really like reading this woman's work, Dr. Stephanie Senna, the one I showed you the stuff before. She's a senior research uh, scientist from MIT. And she did a paper about a year and a half ago. And what she wrote about was with, with, with Anthony Sample, glyphosate pathways to modern disease, celiac sprue, that's another name for celiac disease, and gluten intolerance. And what Stephanie said is, and I think this is really important, that gluten is the most important <coughs> causal factor. So, what we're starting to see, as I'm starting to put this jigsaw puzzle together for you, is it just the gluten issue that's causing these issues, or do we really have some other things going on? And I'm starting to give you, I hope, the evidence to arm you to realize that there's more than just a gluten problem that's something else is happening, and I'm hoping to give you the evidence so you can question yourselves what else is happening to our children. So I have a uh, glyphosate toxicity. How do I treat it? I just want to throw something out there. There's so many kids who are toxic in the US. I often run an environmental toxin panel in the urine where I look at things like solids, plastics, styrene, phthalates, and kids often have high toxic levels. I spoke to a toxicologist, one of my colleagues, and I said, Mark, Dr. Schaus, what do I do about this? He said, oh, give them glycine. Glycine's an amino acid, easy to take. It comes in a powder. It's very inexpensive. And I tried it, particularly with kids who I thought were toxic. They had a lot of brain inflammation. They had a lot of plastics. Plastics, children's brains do not like plastics. Phthalates, it's in like nail polish and, and cosmetics and other products, soft vinyl. Gave some kids uh, glycine, and some kids got better. And I said, whoa, what's going on here? So I look at, look at glycine, I look at glyphosate. If you notice, glycine is the major amino acid in glyphosate. And I thought to myself, light bulb number three. I said, no, really? Are you guys thinking what I'm thinking? Is this possibly a competitive effect by giving glycine that is competing with the glyphosate, and my patients are really glyphosate toxic as well. So I emailed Stephanie Senna. I said, is this possible? I'm not a scientist. I need to reach out to my scientific colleagues. And she said, absolutely. One of my favorite Navajo statements. <laughs> so I'm not going to go into the medical evaluation tonight, how I work these kids up. I'll allow myself to have questions later, you know, either formally or informally, and you can ask me questions about the medical evaluation. So we talk a lot about organic food. You can avoid the whole mess by eating organic. So as you probably know, we tried to label GMOs in California two years ago. Right before we did have this labeling law coming up in November, this paper came out in September, very timely, I thought, from Stanford, minor university in the US. And Dr. Rabada wrote a paper, Little Evidence of Health Benefits from Organic Food. That's what the paper said. So basically, eating organic food, there was little evidence that there was any benefit. 
But she said one thing in one paragraph at the end of her paper. And what she did say, that two studies of children consuming organic and conventional diets did find lower levels of pesticide residues in the urine of children on an organic diet, though the significance of the findings on child health is unclear. What's the question? Is the significance of finding lower levels of pesticides on child health unclear? Is that accurate? Doctor from Stanford said so, I should believe it, right? Well, let me go to another study. I'm gonna show you this one, Chemakos. It's a study that's been going on for 13 years in a growing region of, of California, the Salinas Valley, where mostly migrant workers live and their children. And it's at uh, UC Berkeley, at a Berkeley uh, a School of Public Health. And what this one doctor found, Dr. Eskenazi, that those children in that valley weren't doing that well. They had extremely high levels of ADHD, uh, where they can't focus, poor uh, birth outcomes, low tone, motor tone, and the health overall was not so good. So maybe the findings and the clinical, the clinical significance of eating organic food is clearer than, you know, than she presented. So where, I gave you another study, which I'm not gonna go into, but if you want the slides, we'll be able to give them to you as well. So I didn't invent this concept. It's been around for a long time. Fertility is a problem as well in the U.S. where we, with women, and we're going to talk about in seven minutes, but we'll be talking about fertility as well a little bit. So what am I saying? That gluten is, the, is only part of the story. It's not the whole thing. I guess I'm kind of drilling this point into you a little bit. So in summary, and I'm going to read this to you, that GMOs disrupt the intestinal lining and cause gut inflammation in animals, and you saw this yourself with those slides with Dr. Pusey. Glyphosate potentiates this toxicity, the accumulation of the minerals, altering your detoxification pathways, and causing imbalances in your gut mi microbiome by selecting out organisms that are more pathological. The subsequent health issues in kids can include food allergy, gluten, and others, autoimmune disease, disease with underlying brain inflammation, et cetera. So what do we need are human feeding studies. And I won't go into that, but that's what we need. Right now, there are none. Just a reminder of, <laughs> I, I tell my parents this all the time, eat like your parents. My mom gave me food out of a can, probably not the best thing, but my grandparents came from a farm. So what do we do? Well, I tell a lot of my patients, got to go back in the kitchen. Someone's got to go back in the kitchen. I left the kitchen in 1970, part of the women's lib movement. I was right there. I wasn't burning my bras, but I was right there. But when we go back in the kitchen this time, hopefully we all go back in the kitchen, men, women, children, not just the women's work. So what do we do about this problem? Well, this would be my favorite method of dealing with issues, but probably I wouldn't have a job. I might have to move down here to New Zealand. Perhaps in New Zealand, you might prefer this method of how we deal with this problem. Or our youngest members, starting a little political activist, there's this method as well. I think Zen Cup will address some of these uh, questions for you a little bit later in our talk tonight. So in summary, how do we know pesticides are affecting uh, children's health? Where are the human studies? And I say, can we practice a modicum of common sense, also known as the precautionary principle? And those doctors saying, prove we'll be loyal, prove we won't be. So we're working on a website with a colleague and myself. It should be out pretty soon. It's going to be science-based problems with GMOs. Working on a book, not that I ever thought I'd be an author, but because I can only reach so many kids in my clinical practice per day. And what about all the other kids out there that I can't reach? I, and, and this is a problem. So many of my moms and my parents tell me when they talk to their regular pediatricians, they're either dismissed, seen as crazy, or told that there's nothing they can do. Well, I, I, I think there's more that we can do. So, anyway, so I want to say that if you need to contact me, I'll have my contact information available for you. Um, and that's where I live, at that clinic, and I'm there a lot, probably way more than I want to be, but I'm there a lot. 
And I just want to thank you all for being an attentive and good audience. Appreciate it.